what's up everybody welcome back moving on with the capital structure chapter we're now going to be talking about homemade leverage in this video and to do a quick little review when we went over financial leverage the conclusion that we came to was that taking on debt taking on leverage for a company magnifies the gains and losses to shareholders basically makes the stock more volatile makes the shares more risky and because of that it would make sense for us to further conclude that capital structure decisions of a company are then important right because of the effect that financial leverage has to shareholders well this actually this statement is not necessarily true and that's what we're going to go over in this video and the reason why it's not true is because shareholders can use something called homemade leverage to expose themselves to how much ever leverage they want to be exposed to no matter what the company is doing. And more specifically, what homemade leverage is, the definition of it is basically personal borrowing or lending to increase or decrease leverage respectively. So for example, let's say that you own the stock of a company and let's say that this company is all equity they have no debt so they are unlevered but you want to have payoffs of a company that is levered you want to increase that risk of your stock you want to magnify your gains and losses well Obviously, you can't tell the company to go into more debt. They want to stay unlevered. But what you can do on your personal side is you can go and borrow money. Personally, and then with that borrowed money, you can purchase more stock. And then what's going to happen is that your cash flows now are going to give you or they're going to be the same as the cash flows of a levered company and we'll show through examples how this technically works but just from a higher level that's what's happening now this doesn't necessarily have to be an unlevered company either this process just means that you're increasing leverage for any stock so let's say that maybe the stock you own the company has 20 percent debt but you want to have the same cash flows of a company that has 40% debt. Well, you would still do the same process. You would still go borrow personally, buy more of that 20% debt stock, and the cash flows would then be the same of you owning a company that has 40% debt. So that first scenario we just went over is to increase leverage. What if you want to do the opposite? What if you want to decrease leverage? So let's say you own the stock of a levered company, a company that has debt, and you want to have exposure to a company that is unlevered or that has less debt. Well, you would just do the opposite. What would happen here is you would take a portion of your stock holdings, you would sell them, you would receive cash, and then you would lend that cash. And this process would give you the cash flows of an unlevered company. So I should actually maybe even add that in here. So in between here, what you're doing is you are selling stock. So you're selling stock, getting money, and then you're personally lending. And then over here in this first process, perhaps I should add, when you borrow money, you are buying more stock. All right, and these are the two just high level processes that you're gonna go over with homemade leverage. So it depends what you wanna do. If you're trying to increase leverage, borrow money, buy more stock, or the opposite, if you wanna decrease leverage, you sell some of your stock holdings, get that cash, lend that cash out, and now you'll have cash flows of a less levered company. Now this, again, it doesn't have to be necessarily an unlevered company. Perhaps your company has 40% debt and you want exposure to a company that only has 20% debt. Well, the same process would uh, occur. Now, before we get into specific examples, uh, I thought I would mention the assumptions 
that have to be present in order for this concept of homemade leverage to work. So the two biggest ones are number one, individuals and corporations can borrow and lend at the same interest rate. So the interest rate on debt is basically the same for corporations and individuals. And then number two, it's a world where no taxes are paid. So now we're gonna get a little bit more technical by introducing a scenario. So let's say that you own 150 shares of a company that is all equity finance with 9,000 shares outstanding and each share sells for $42. The earnings before interest and taxes is 40,000. The company is debating of converting into a 40% debt capital structure with 8% interest and we are ignoring taxes. So whenever I get a scenario like this, the first thing I like to do is create balance sheets of the different capital structures if it's possible to do so. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two balance sheets. So I'm going to create the balance sheet of the current company that is all equity. And then I'm going to create a balance sheet for the proposed capital structure. And that's going to be 40% debt. So let's start off with the company currently. So we have assets, debt, and then we have equity. Well, because this company is all equity finance, we know the debt currently is definitely zero dollars. What about this equity portion? Well, we're told that there are 9,000 shares outstanding and they are selling for $42. So the total value of the equity is going to be the 9,000 shares times the price per share, $42. And when you multiply those out, you end up getting 378,000. So that is what the current company's equity is worth. So debt is zero, equity is 378,000. Well, that means that the assets of the company must be worth 378,000 as well because this is a balance sheet. Left side and right side have to balance. So now let's create the balance sheet for the proposed uh, capital structure. So notice how this is still gonna be the same company and we're just gonna be changing that right side of the balance sheet, the mix of debt and equity. So the assets are still gonna be worth 378,000. So that left side is still gonna be the same. That's what the company is worth. Now, usually what happens is we're given or we've been given the amount of debt that we take on. So then we figure out how many shares have been repurchased, et cetera, et cetera. But in this case, they don't give us the dollar amount of debt. They just said that it's going to be a 40% debt, uh, debt capital structure. So the way you figure out the debt then is basically 40% of the firm value or the assets is going to be debt. So you take that 370000 multiply it by 0 0.4, 40% in decimals, and you get 151,200. So the debt in this case is going to be worth $151,200. Okay, so now what's the equity going to be? Well, we just have to balance it out. So we can take 378,000 and subtract 151,200. And when you do that, you end up getting $226,800 for the equity. So this here is the new balance sheet for the proposed uh, capital structure. So notice how the value of the firm is still the same, 370,000 value of the assets. It's just this mix of debt and equity is different. Now this uh, firm, is financed with 40% debt. Now, how many shares are there in the equity section? Notice that here, there were 9,000 shares. How many are gonna be here? Is it still 9,000? Well, no, because what happened was the company took on debt, specifically 151, 200 worth, and they repurchased shares. So if you remember, 
to figure out how many shares were repurchased, what we can do is we can take the amount of debt that the company took on and divide it by the share price. And the current share price is 42. And when you do that, you end up getting 3,600. So 3,600 shares were repurchased. Well, initially there were 9,000 shares. So 9,000 uh, 9, shares to start, 3,600 shares were repurchased. That means that there are 5,400 shares now remaining in this new capital structure. So these are the two balance sheets of the company when it is all equity finance and then of the same company when it is financed with 40% debt. So now that we have the balance sheet of both capital structures, what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer or ask rather a bunch of questions that come up fairly often with homemade leverage. So the first question that you'll probably see, whether in your textbooks or on your midterm, is what is the cash flow to you as a shareholder under both capital structures? So if you remember, you as a shareholder own 150 shares of this company. That's what was given in the scenario initially. And when they're asking you for the cash flow to you as a shareholder or to any shareholder, what you have to start with is making the income statement for both capital structures. So let's start off with this current uh, all equity finance capital structure. Now, if you remember, the earnings before interest and taxes was given. And the earnings before interest and taxes was 40,000. So this is the earnings before interest and taxes. Well, what's the interest? Interest is dependent on how much debt the company has. And notice in this case, because it's all equity finance, zero dollars worth of debt, that means there is zero dollars worth of interest. And then taxes are zero because we are ignoring taxes in this scenario. So that means the company has a net income here of 40,000. Basically it's equal to its earnings before interest and taxes. So now that we have the income statement for the all equity capital structure, let's create one for the 40% debt capital structure. So the earnings before interest and taxes it's not going to change. It's still going to be 40,000 because our assets are still the same. They're still producing that same income. So the earnings before interest and taxes are 40,000 here as well. But now notice because this company has some debt, we're going to have to be paying interest on the income statement. And if you remember, we mentioned that the interest rate was 8% initially. So to calculate the interest, what we would do is we would take the amount of debt that we have as a company or uh, that the company has, 151, 200, and multiply it by 0 0.08. And when you do that, you get 12,096. So that is the amount of interest that the company is paying. We are still ignoring taxes, so the taxes are going to be zero. So taking that earnings before interest and taxes and then subtracting the interest, we end up getting a net income of $27,904. So notice how the net income change with this new capital structure. Because we have that debt, we now have to pay interest. So we have the net income now for both capital structures, but what do we have to find out? We're trying to find out what are the cash flows to us as the shareholders who own 150 shares of this company. Notice that the net income here, that's the cash flow to the company as a whole. So now what we can do is we can figure out what the earnings per share is for both capital structures. And if you remember, earnings per share is what? It's the net income 
over the number of shares. Well, the net income in this case for the all equity company is 40,000 and there are 9,000 or this is not in dollar terms, rather this should be in dollar terms and then there are 9,000 shares outstanding. So when you divide both of these, you end up getting $4.44. So each share is earning $4.44 for the all equity capital structure. And then for the levered capital structure, we would do the same thing. We would take the net income, which is now 27,904, and divide it by the number of shares, which is 5,400. And when you divide both of those, you end up getting $5.17 for their earnings per share. So each share for this capital structure for this company is earning $5.17. So this is on a per share basis, both of these numbers here. So if we want the cash flow to us, where we own 150 shares, what we can do is we can take that earnings per share of $4.44 and multiply it by the number of shares that we own, which is 150. And when we multiply that out, you end up getting $666. So that's how much cash flow that we are getting. Now, if you remember, earnings can be either retained in the company or paid out as dividends. In this case, we're just assuming that the company is paying out 100% dividends. So all the earnings as, as uh, shareholders, we are getting in cash. So we get $666 under this capital structure. And then under this capital structure here, same thing. The earnings per share is $5.17 and we own 150 shares. And when you multiply those out, you end up getting $775.50, and let's just keep it at $775. We are rounding a lot anyway. We're rounding these uh, earnings per shares in this case and in this case, so let's just keep the cash flow at $775. So that is the answer to our first question. These two figures are the cash flows that we are getting if we own 150 shares of these companies. It's the same company, but with different capital structures.